Monorepos are such a powerful way to ship, but taming the monorepo beast can be a lot. There's a lot to know and think through, and if you design your monorepo poorly, results can be disastrous, especially at scale. Still, when you get a monorepo right, it makes code sharing so easy, and you get to make a single commit to one repo to get your changes out quicker, and you can make all your builds, lints, tests, and other tasks super fast with Turbo Repo. And honestly, it might not be as hard as you think. That's why in this series, we're going to learn the fundamentals of JavaScript and TypeScript monorepos. This series is generally designed for folks who are new to monorepos, but I promise if you're a seasoned monorepoer, monorepoist, monorepoian, or even anywhere in between, there should be some nuggets of wisdom in here for you too, so stick around. Welcome to From Zero to Turbo. First things first, we need to set the base for your monorepo. We need a sound structure to work with to set up for everything else we're gonna do with the tools and libraries you wanna use in your monorepo. Those tools will use the conventions of the JavaScript ecosystem, so we should be building on those expectations as well to keep things running smoothly. Before I open my editor, let's make sure we understand things conceptually. I like to think of the anatomy of a monorepo in layers. Our outermost layer in our monorepo is the repository itself. You'll find the root of your version control here, usually Git, and this is the box that all of your code is in. This really is the truest definition of monorepo. There are some more advanced patterns out there where this distinction matters more, but it's good enough for now to say, hey, this is the bucket your code lives in. Typically, what you find in this bucket is a package manager workspace. In the JavaScript ecosystem, the three major package managers are npm, yarn, and pnpm, with bun as an honorable mention at the time of this recording. These package managers have built-in support for establishing packages in that workspace, allowing you to organize code into smaller subsections within the workspace. Now, a brief but important pause. This is the part where I do want to stop and say, as you learn more about modern repos, you might notice that the word workspace doesn't mean the same thing to each package manager. I've even seen a package manager disagree with itself in its own documentation about what the word workspace means. This can unfortunately be a little confusing, so to define this for our purposes, when I say workspace, this is the layer that has a root package JSON, a lock file for your package manager, and then one or many packages that make up the rest of the workspace. All of those things together are the workspace. It's usually located at the root of your repository, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in advanced scenarios. We're not gonna worry about ourselves with that for now. There are two types of workspaces though, single package workspaces and multi-package workspaces. We'll focus on the multi-package workspaces since that's usually what folks are talking about when they say, how do I monorepo? I'll leave a link below for those wondering about single package workspaces, but moving on to a multi-package workspace, a monorepo. This is where internal packages become important. I'll open my editor now and we can see all this play out in code. If you want to follow along with me, you can use mpx create turbo at latest to get a monorepo starter in just a few seconds. Inside, we'll find a workspace with a workspace root. And there are a few key items here. The first place I usually go is the root package JSON, since it sets the scene for your workspace. This is where you write down your most commonly used scripts and install dependencies here that operate at the context of your workspace. These are the things that make your workspace run. You see Turbo here, which we will start using in a moment. You may also find tools like Husky and Lint Stage. But note that these aren't the dependencies of your applications and libraries themselves. We'll talk more extensively about managing dependencies in an upcoming video, but for now, just know that the list of dependencies here should generally remain fairly short. Additionally, if you're using NPM or YARN, you might find a field named workspaces in package.json. If you're using PMPM like I am here, there's a separate PMPM workspace YAML file that does the same thing. Either way, these globs establish the locations of the internal packages in the repository. Your package manager is going to look inside the apps and packages directories one level deep to find directories that have a package JSON of their own. 
those right there are the two minimum requirements for including an internal package in a workspace. The directory is included in the package manager's workspace definition, and the directory has a package JSON of its own. With this setup, now we can easily share code in our repository. For instance, if I check the package JSON of the web application, we'll see that repo UI is installed from within the workspace, just like installing any other package from the NPM registry. It's just that it's in our repository now. And you get to use the package the same way in your code. You can see that I'm referencing at repo UI button here and importing that button from my internal package. We're starting to use internal packages now, so let's talk about the structure of a package. We're gonna be building a package from scratch in a later video, but let's take the time to see what we have here right now. In the same way that your root package JSON sets up and lays the foundation for your workspace, a package JSON in a package sets up the package. It gives the package a name, and this is how we reference it in other packages like you just saw. And additionally, the exports field establishes the entry points to the package. This is how you define the public API to this package. These are the places that users of this package can get to the code inside. You can see here that there is a button entry point and it's referring to uh, SRC button.tsx module. When I open up that module, we see the export here for export const button. And that's what we saw back on page.tsx. We can use this button here. To take this a bit further, I can add some export here for maybe just some random string. And if I go back up to page.tsx in the application, we'll find this variable is available now coming out of that at repo slash UI slash button entry point that we were using before. It's nice to be able to work that way. I can add code and subtract code and it's just immediately available to me. It's, it's really nice. The other thing that's important to note here is that I'm accessing that package's code using the conventions that I was talking about before from the JavaScript ecosystem. All of this stuff resolves using all of those workspace algorithms that we were talking about before. So that means that if you were to do something like this and try to get over to packages and then maybe into UI and SRC, a path like this breaks out of the workspaces package graph and we don't want that. We're out respecting the package boundaries that we worked so hard to create thus far. So we wanna avoid doing this. Last, I want to mention the scripts that are down in the package JSON of this UI package. A package can define its own scripts. They can be ran within the scope of the package itself, allowing us to break up the work of building linting, type checking, and everything else we need to do into individual packages. This is vital as a code base grows and scales. If each package can do its own work, we can make things dramatically faster. And that actually brings us right to Turbo Repo. With all that in place, we can start reaping the rewards of the structure you've just created. As an example, this is a Turbo Repo and TurboRepo relies on these conventions of the JavaScript ecosystem that you've been building on. I have the TurboRepo CLI installed globally, so if I run Turbo Build now, TurboRepo will be able to inspect my repository and using some small configuration from TurboJSON that we'll discuss more in an upcoming video actually, run tasks as fast as possible. We'll see that we can build both of our applications in the starter repository in parallel all thanks to the knowledge built into the structure that you've just created. Turbo Repo supercharges our scripts in other ways as well. For instance, if I run Turbo Build again, this will result in a full turbo. It's going to instantly hit cache. Since I didn't change any of my code, there's no reason to do any of this work for a second time. Same code in, same code out. We can simply restore it from cache. This pattern becomes extremely important as your code base grows. You can have more code and more packages and stay fast. Even better, I could run Turbo Link to connect my repository to a remote cache so we can share those cached builds to our teammates and our CI machines and everyone can reuse that build that I just ran. By default, I'm gonna be connecting to Vercel Remote Cache 
and that'll actually help me take this one step further. How does setting up this structure help us when it comes to deployment time as well? You can of course deploy your Turbo Rebo anywhere you'd like, but I have Vercel handy, so I'll open that up. I pushed this repository to GitHub, so now I can go to create a project, and I'll see that I can import this new project. Vercel will be able to detect where the applications are in the repository. You can see that the root directory shows my apps slash docs directory, which is where my docs site is. It detected Next.js, and so I can quickly deploy this, and we're done. We have a build going, again, thanks to using that structure that we created. Looking back at this build log, you might notice that it was uh, so fast, 27 seconds. If I open up this log, you'll notice that this task was ran, it hit cache, and it was a full turbo. Remember when I linked my repository to Vercel Remote Cache earlier? Vercel is automatically linked to that same remote cache, so it knows about that build already ran and it's just gonna reuse it. Again, no reason to redo all that work. Just like that, a full build system with a caching layer shared across everything. Pretty cool. That gets us acquainted with the structural basics, how things work, why things work, and gives you a little taste of the benefits of following along with the conventions of the JavaScript ecosystem. We've set ourselves, our teams, and our repo up for future success. If you're looking for a written version of this material, visit turbo.build. I'll leave a link below along with some other goodies. And in the next video, we'll keep building on top of these fundamentals. Please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and post a comment to let me know what you think or any questions you have. See you in the next one.